When you're learning the different types of connective tissue, it's important that you use Table 4.1 in your textbook as your guide, and this is what we'll be going through as we go through the next few slides. Now you should be able to identify the slides that are in the textbook, but you don't have to identify any microscope slides. You'll be doing this in lab. So remember that all connective tissue, which I'm just going to abbreviate as CT, are all living cells that are going to be surrounded by matrix. So make sure you know what the important components of this matrix are. This was in the last mini lecture. And all mature connective tissue is going to arrive from a common embryonic type of tissue that is called the mesenchyme. And once this mesenchyme then differentiates, it's going to specialize into a certain type of connective tissue. And the first group of connective tissue that we're going to talk about has six different types within it. It's called the connective tissue proper. And it's classified into the loose connective tissue. And so the loose connective tissue means that there is lots of space between the different fibers in the extracellular matrix. And then there's also the dense connective tissue, which has very little space that's found within the extracellular matrix. So the uh, first group that we're going to look at is the areolar connective tissue. And this is on our next slide that we have here. And in this example, again, it's important that you know where we find this type of connective tissue and what its major function in the body is going to be. So in this type of connective tissue, notice it's a subtype of loose connective tissue. So there's lots of space in the matrix. And the predominant type of cell that we have is called the fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts appear kind of spindle shape, um, and they predominate. And the Latin term areola actually means a small open space. And you see lots of empty space here. The areolar connective tissue is going to act somewhat like a reservoir for water and salt, but it's going to be surrounding a lot of body tissue. So it's going to wrap, and it's going to cushion various organs and there's going to be macrophages that are going to phagocytize bacteria so it plays an important role in inflammation and there's a high content of hyaluronic acid so what this does is in this situation here we see that the extracellular matrix this extra space that's right here is going to be very thick it's going to be somewhat like the consistency of molasses and it's going to be very viscous and so in the in the body when there is edema for example this areolar tissue tends to soak up excess fluid kind of like a sponge would so the best way that you can think of this particular type of tissue is you can think of it kind of like universal packing material I like to describe it kind of like bubble wrap it's going to package organs it's going to surround capillaries. And you can also see that it's going to be located deep to epithelium. And when it's deep to epithelium, it's going to form what's called the proper layer. It's uh, described as the lamina propria. So this is a, the, one of the very important uses for areolar connective tissue, which again is a subtype of loose connective tissue. Our next example of loose connective tissue is adipose tissue. And this one is very, very distinct. With adipose tissue, these cells are called adipocytes. And the adipocyte would be the specific name for the cell itself. And in chapter 2, you learned about triglycerides. Triglycerides make up the large majority of these cells. The entire cell is actually filled with a fat droplet, a lipid droplet. And this is almost entirely going to be triglycerides, which are used as energy storage. And so one of the predominant 
places that we find triglycerides is going to be in the subcutaneous tissue, so under the skin in the hypodermis. Another name for the hypodermis is subcutaneous. So if, you're, if a nurse is told to give a shot sub-Q, that's an abbreviation for the subcutaneous area. Also in the belly where we don't necessarily want a lot of adipose tissue, uh, it's found surrounding a lot of organs like the kidneys, uh, around the eyeballs, and then also in breast tissue but it provides a reserve fuel. It's very important for insulation. And again, the matrix is gonna be very, very sparse. And the interesting thing that we actually see about an adipocyte is that the lipid droplet is gonna take up so much of the cell that the nucleus is going to be found on the periphery. And with these particular cells, the cell is going to look almost perfectly circular or oval. There's a couple different types of fat. There is brown fat and also white adipose tissue, white fat. And the difference is in the amount of mitochondria. The um, white fat stores um, are going to have less mitochondria than the brown fat stores. So the energy uh, amount that it provides is different based on the two. And there's lots more, a lot of uh, brown fat that is found in babies, for example. Now the next type of loose connective tissue that we have is reticular connective tissue. So again, it's a subtype of loose connective tissue, as you can see up here. And in reticular connective tissue. Again, this acts kind of as an internal framework, so a network if you will, and it's going to provide an internal skeleton which is called the stroma, and it's found mainly um, as a supporting type of tissue. Support for other cell types like white blood cells, mast cells, and also macrophages. So we find it in lymphoid organs like lymph nodes, bone marrow and also spleen. So it looks very distinctly different than the other two types of loose connective tissue. So these are the three types of loose connective tissue. We then have three types of dense connective tissue. And again, dense connective tissue means that there is very little space. So the, uh, the matrix is very com compact. And our first example of this would be dense regular connective tissue. And in this case, there are many collagen fibers. So the collagen fibers are the main fibers that actually make up this type of connective tissue. You'll see that it's located in joints, so it makes up ligaments and tendons. And what's important to remember about this is that the collagen fibers are very, very parallel. And in this case, the ligaments and the tendons are going to attach muscles to bones or to um, other muscles. And we find uh, these in tendons, ligaments, and also flattened tendons, which are called aponeuroses in this example. So again, the big difference is that the collagen fibers are parallel. There's somewhat of a slightly wavy appearance, as you can see here. And tendons are going to be attaching muscles to bones, and uh, ligaments are going to be attaching bones to other bones. So that's the difference, which we'll talk more about in subsequent chapters. The next type of dense connective tissue that we have is called dense irregular connective tissue. And the difference here is that the collagen fibers are going to be irregularly arranged. So they're going to be going in different directions. And the reason they go in different directions is to withstand tension that could be in, exerted in many different directions. So a great example of this would be in the dermis, where we have dense irregular connective tissue. Again, it's a subtype of dense connective tissue. Also, the submucosa of the digestive tract is another example that we find this. And so the third example of dense connective tissue which again is under that heading of the connective tissue proper, is going to be elastic connective tissue. So as you would expect, this is found in the area of the body 
where we would have an abundance of elastic fibers. So there's actually very little or no collagen in this example. So it's in the parts of the body where we would want stretching and recoiling of the tissue. So passive recoiling of the lungs once we breathe in, which is called inspiration, also in the arteries. So a good example of this would be the aorta. Also certain ligaments that are within the vertebral column where we would find this. So this concludes the six different examples of connective tissue proper. The next three examples are all going to be cartilage. And there's three different types of cartilage. The first type is a is hyaline cartilage. And in all three types of cartilage, we have mature cells, which are called chondrocytes. So the word chondrocyte actually means cartilage cell. And it's only going to be in these uh, different types, these three types of cartilage. So a mature or an immature cartilage cell is called a chondrocyte or chondroblast rather. So remember blast means immature cell. And when it's mature, it's now a chondrocyte in a space called a lacuna. So the word lacuna we're going to deal with in the next unit. And lacuna actually means space. So in this situation, the hyaline cartilage is really the most common. It's very tough, but also flexible. Remember that cartilage is one example of an avascular type of connective tissue. Uh, so remember, connective tissue is the most diverse of all types of tissue that we have. Now, the entire embryonic skeleton begins as hyaline cartilage. And there's some places in the skeleton where hyaline cartilage actually remains. This would be in joints. Also in the ribs, it's called costal cartilage, the cartilage of your nose, tracheal rings, and also part of the larynx. But again, what you're seeing is the chondrocyte, which is located in the lacuna. So this would be one example of chondrocyte in a lacuna right here on this slide. Now our next example of cartilage is going to be elastic cartilage. And elastic cartilage is found in places where there's a lot more flexibility. And so the examples here to know are the external ear and also the epiglottis. Areas of the body, um, like the epiglottis, need to be able to bend very, very quickly. And what you can see on this slide are really an abundance of elastic fibers. These are the very thin fibers that you see here. So this would be the elastin or the elastic fibers, the protein, which is very, very flexible. And you can also see that the chondrocyte in the lacuna is much larger than in the previous one here. In this example of hyaline cartilage, if we go back here, it almost looks like um, the matrix has a glassy or an amorphous um, appearance to it. And the third type of cartilage, besides the hyaline cartilage and the elastic cartilage, is the fibrocartilage. And the fibrocartilage, the one thing that makes it stick out is there's going to be an abundance of collagen. This collagen is going to make this type of cartilage much, much tougher. So it's compressible, it resists tension. So it's found in places like the intervertebral discs, which um, deal with a lot of compressive forces, also the pubic symphysis and the disc of the knee, the menisci. So a special characteristic of it is tensile strength, the ability to absorb compressive shock. And also we, we see all the collagen in the slide here and we see an, a, a small amount of chondrocytes which are actually found in the lacuna here. So they look differently than the other two examples. So again, the appearance of a chondrocyte, as long as there is a chondrocyte, you know that it is not one of the six examples of connective tissue proper. You know that it has to be one of the three different types of cartilage. Now the next couple examples that we have, we have bone, which is called osseous tissue. And in this example, we have osteocytes 
which are now within lacuna as well. We have a central canal and we have little rings that are called lamellae and we'll talk more about this in the next unit. But in this case, uh, the bones of the skeleton provide cavities for storage of fat, so there is adipose tissue that's actually within the marrow itself. And this is one reason that animals actually like to, to suck the marrow out of bones because it is fat in the marrow, it's triglycerides. It's, uh, the matrix is very hard and very, very calcified. So it has an abundance of collagen fibers and the osteocytes are in spaces called lacunae. And bone is very, very important. It provides levers for muscles, uh, stores calcium and other minerals like phosphate. And remember from chapter one that one of the functions of the skeletal system is that it's the function for hematopoiesis. And then finally, the last example of connected tissue that we have is blood. Blood is going to be the most vascular. And in this situation, blood is going to be primarily a transport medium for gases like oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, other waste products. So the oxygen is going to be able to diffuse in one direction. Uh, there's supposed to be a two there and then the carbon dioxide also diffuses. So the matrix in this case is made up of blood plasma. All of this extra space that we see here would be the plasma. So it would have a liquid matrix. So really the only example of connective tissue that has a true, uh, not living, but a true liquid matrix and this is the same thing for lymph fluid as well. So a liquid, a true liquid matrix. Some of the other matrix can be more of a gel and viscous, uh, like the areolar connected tissue, but this one actually has a liquid matrix. And the cells then, one of the major components of connected tissue, could be things like a neutrophil or a lymphocyte, or even cell fragments like a platelet that we see here. And of course the erythrocytes or the red blood cells.